Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Audible. Many of you probably already have Audible and listen to audiobooks like I do, but if you don't, you should. More on Audible later, including a book recommendation from me. For now, Amazon Prime members can get Audible for just $4.95 a month for the first three months. That's essentially like getting three months for the price of one. After that, it's only $14.95 a month, and this offer ends on the 31st of July, 2019. Go to audible.com forward slash brainfood or text brainfood one word to 500 500. That'll only work if you're in the USA though. The USDA's first nutrition guidelines go all the way back to 1894. These essentially were moderation in everything, eat a variety of nutrition-rich foods, watch your portion size, and avoid eating too much fat. This is a surprisingly good recommendation given the then state of knowledge about human biology, and it's vastly superior to their changing recommendations over the next century or so, the most famous of which is the food pyramid, which was introduced in the late 20th century. So how and when did the food pyramid idea come about? Well, for that, we need to head to Sweden. The very first food pyramid was a Swedish invention, and it was an invention of necessity more than anything else. Back in the 1970s, Sweden saw its country gripped by high food prices. The government then tasked the Social Storelsen, the National Board of Health and Welfare, with coming up with a way to help the situation. In response to this, in 1972, they came up with basic and supplementary foods. In a nutshell, basic Basic foods were foods considered essential to a person's well-being, and supplementary foods were foods that provided vitamins and minerals that basic foods did not. However, it was one Anna-Britt Ansatter, working for Cooperativa Forbundet, the Swedish Cooperative Union, a retail grocery cooperative, who really pushed the idea to the next level. Though the Social Storelsen's basic food idea was a good one, Anna felt that it could be improved upon and developed an idea of a triangular model to better visualize the portions involved. Here. The scheme was officially unveiled to the Swedish populace in Cooperativa Forbundet's annual magazine under the headline Good Wholesome Food at Reasonable Prices. An important thing to note here is that the Social Storelsen, and by expansion the Swedish government itself, sought to distance itself from the pyramid in lieu of using a dietary circle model. This version of the circular model, though useful for representing what foods were important, was criticized for not explicitly showing how much of each food type should be consumed, something the pyramid model did in a simple and visually striking way. Now, If you take a quick look at the original pyramid, you may notice that there are some stark differences with the eventual USDA version. There's a reason for this beyond simply a more modern understanding of nutrition and health. That's pressure from lobbyists and heavy hitters in the food industry. You see, the food pyramid stood to be the go-to standard millions of Americans would base their entire diet around, and billions of dollars were at stake. For example, you may notice that in the earliest 1992 version in America, dairy gets its own section, whereas in the Swedish version it is simply bundled along with other staple foods. This isn't an accident, and subconsciously this suggests that dairy products are an essential part of one's diet, which is obviously not true, since many cultures throughout history got along perfectly fine without non-human milk, as do vegans and others today. If you are guessing that entities within the dairy industry lobbied hard for this modification, it's generally thought that you're absolutely correct. You may also notice that the original American pyramid suggests 6 to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta per day. According to the leader of a group of nutritionists who developed the initial version of that food pyramid for the United States, Louis Light, this was due to interference from food industry giants as well. Light went so far as to state that the pyramids the nutritionists created ultimately got, to quote her, sold to the highest bidder. She goes on to state, when our version of the food guide came back to us revised, we were shocked to find that it was vastly different from the one we had developed. As I later discovered, the wholesale changes made to the guide by the Office of the Secretary of Agriculture were calculated to win the acceptance of the food industry. For instance, the Agricultural Secretary's Office altered wording to emphasize processed foods over fresh and whole foods to downplay lean meats and low-fat dairy choices because the meat and milk lobbies believed that it had hurt sales of full-fat products. 
It also hugely increased the servings of wheat and other grains to make the wheat growers happy. The meat lobby also got the final word on the color of the saturated fat slash cholesterol guideline, which was changed from red to purple because meat producers worried that using red to signify bad would be linked to red meats in consumers' minds. Where we, the USDA nutritionists, called for a base of five to nine servings of fresh fruits and vegetables a day, it was replaced with a paltry two to three servings, changed to five to seven servings a couple of years later because an anti-cancer campaign by another government agency, the National Cancer Institute, forced the USDA to adopt the higher standard. Our recommendation of three to four daily servings of whole grain breads and cereals was changed to a whopping six to eleven servings, forming the base of the food pyramid as a concession to the processed wheat and corn industries. Moreover, my nutritionist group had placed baked goods made with white flour, including crackers, sweets, and other low nutrient foods laden with sugars and fats at the peak of the pyramid, recommending they be eaten sparingly. To our alarm, in the revised food guide, they were now made part of the pyramid's base and in yet one more assault on dietary logic, changes were made to the wording of the dietary guidelines from eat less to avoid too much, giving a nod to the processed food industry interests by not limiting highly profitable fun foods, junk foods by any other name, that might affect the bottom line of food companies. While it's always important to note that correlation does not equal causation, and there likely were many other factors at play here, it's somewhat humorously pointed out by the Wall Street Journal that obesity rates have increased ever since the introduction of the food pyramid, aka the day millions of people suddenly thought eating 11 billion slices of white bread and crackers per day was healthy. This all brings us to 1995, when the pyramid was revised again. At the time, the USDA was under pressure to alter the wording of the pyramid to say, eat less salt and sugar. The sugar industry, however, fought this change, and when the revised pyramid was released, it advised people to eat less salt but moderate their sugar intake. The funny part is that consuming excessive amounts of sugar regularly is most definitely bad for you. But on the sodium side of things, the number one reason most say to maintain a low sodium diet, that high sodium equals high blood pressure and thus higher chance of heart disease, based on the summation of research to date, doesn't actually appear to be correct. For the full story here, you can see our video, Is Salt Actually Bad For You? But in a nutshell, despite almost every major health body in the world recommending lowering salt intake as a way to reduce chronically high blood pressure and thus instances of heart disease, this has actually been an ongoing contentious issue in the medical field for almost half a century, owing to the general lack of evidence that this is actually happening. As Dr. Ronald Baer et al. noted in their 2012 paper, Salt and Public Health, after a careful consideration of the debate over salt, we have concluded that the concealment of scientific uncertainty is a mistake that serves neither the ends of science nor good policy. To briefly sum up why this is so controversial, despite, again, pretty much every major health body recommending low salt intake to improve health, in 2011, two Cochrane reviews found no evidence that low salt diets actually do this. They concluded, after more than 150 random clinical trials and 13 population studies without any obvious signal in favor of sodium reduction, another position could be to accept that such a signal may not exist. So at this point, if you're wondering what you should eat, Harvard for a time put out their own version of the food pyramid that was actually based on good science instead of lobbyist pressure, and has since, along with the USDA, switched to a plate diagram version, showing essentially the ratios of different things that you should put on your plate, though not the specific amount, as this varies from person to person based on a variety of things like their physical activity level, what type of workouts they do, if any, as well as their height, lean body mass, etc. Unsurprisingly, their recommendation mostly comes down to about half of what's on your plate being fruit and vegetables, since they humorously note that potatoes and french fries do not count as a vegetable. Very disappointing, I know. A quarter should be healthy proteins from things like poultry, fish, beans, and nuts, but you should limit red meat and cheese and avoid processed meats altogether. They also note that in cooking, you should always use oils made of mostly healthy fats like olive oil. It's also interesting to note that the latest USDA MyPlate recommendation actually mostly mirrors the Harvard recommendation, with the major divergence being that they still have dairy as its own essential group and even explicitly state the amount of food from the dairy group you need to to eat, again emphasizing that you need to eat dairy to eat healthily. In truth, what people actually need on a high level are protein, carbohydrates, and fats, and a bunch of different vitamins and minerals and the like. 
These can be consumed from a variety of sources, the best of which are more or less outlined in both Harvard's plate and the USDA's, just with the USDA explicitly stating to get what you need here, you need to eat dairy products, which isn't true at all, and I'm sure the dairy industry had nothing to do with the decision to make sure that it's got its own group on the USDA's my plate. So if you want to learn more about this whole topic and take a deep dive into the whole nutrition thing, but you know, having that information actually based on facts, then I'd recommend checking out two Audible books, Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, and Thinner, Leaner, Stronger. Both are written by Michael Matthews. The first one is for guys, and the second one is for girls. In a nutshell, they are extremely well-researched and ultra-science-backed, which are things we like here at Today I Found Out, and they cut through all of the BS out there when it comes to nutrition and fitness, and they get to the core of what's really important to do when you work out, and just in regard to getting optimal health. It turns out that none of this is rocket surgery, nor even terribly time-consuming on the workout side, nor does it require any sort of bizarre workout program or super restrictive diet. They are easy reads, easy to understand, and when finished, you'll know pretty much everything you need to know to stay super fit and healthy and eat right and in a sustainable way with as minimum effort as possible. All right, but why go with Audible? Well, that's because it's the best way to do it. Membership gives you one free book a month, no matter the length. Indeed, the book that I recommended just now, it's 19 hours long. It's a bit of a beast. Audible also have a huge range of titles, amazing apps with Speed Listen, which I personally use a lot. And of course, with Audible, you own the books. If you cancel later, you'll still have the books that you bought so you can go back and listen to them anytime you want. And if you ever get a book you don't like, you can just swap it for one you do. Plus, every month you get two free Audible originals as well, and these get you exclusive content that is only available at Audible. Amazon Prime members can get Audible for just $4.95 a month for the first three months. That's essentially getting three months for the price of one. After that, it's $14.95 a month. This offer ends on the 31st of July 2019. Just go to audible.com forward slash brain food, or if you're in the US, you can text brain food one word to 500 500. And as always, thank you for watching.